Our reading today comes from uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 43. And the context of this reading is that um, in chapter 9, we've heard how Jesus has first called the 12 disciples and sent them out on their missionary journey. And, and it says how he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and other diseases. Uh, there's then the feeding of the 5,000. There's Peter's declaration about Jesus, the Caesarea Philippi experience that we have from the other Gospels. And then, of course, Jesus tells the disciples uh, for the first time about the plan that he is to go to Jerusalem to suffer at the hands of the religious authorities and then be killed. And then we have our reading. About a week after he had said these things, Jesus took Peter, John and James with him and went up a hill to pray. While he was praying, his face changed its appearance and his clothes became dazzlingly white. Suddenly, two men were there talking with him. They were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in heavenly glory and talked with Jesus about the way in which he would soon fulfil God's purpose by dying in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were sound asleep. But they woke up and saw Jesus' glory and the two men who were standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, how good it is that we are here. We will make three tents, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not really know what he was saying. While he was still speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them with its shadow, and the disciples were afraid as the cloud came over them. A voice said from the cloud, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice stopped, there was Jesus all alone. The disciples kept quiet about all this and told no one at that time anything that they had seen. The next day, Jesus and the three disciples went down from the hill and a large crowd met Jesus. A man shouted from the crowd, Teacher, I beg you, Look at my son, my only son. A spirit attacks him with a sudden shout and throws him into a fit so that he foams at the mouth. It keeps on hurting him and will hardly let him go. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. Jesus answered, How unbelieving and wrong you people are. How long must I stay with you? How long do I have to put up with you? Then he said to the man, Bring your son here. As the boy was coming, the demon knocked him to the ground and threw him into a fit. Jesus gave a command to the evil spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. All the people were amazed at the mighty power of God. So, the way Luke has constructed this material is very much along the lines that we have frustration from Jesus at the inability of the disciples to grasp what he has been telling them. After all, he just sent them out on a missionary journey to be with real people in extreme situations of life and gave them the power to be able to restore their physical health and to cast out demons. The power and the extraordinary nature of that event must surely alone have convinced people of who Jesus was, well, not people, but the, the, the disciples, about who Jesus was, and should have made it clear to them that all sense of trying to explain what was going on through their own lens and through their own understanding was flawed, because here was clearly something tremendously different. Peter makes that declaration about Jesus, and Jesus tells them about how the events are going to pan out. So in the Transfiguration, we have Peter, James and John, the same people who um, uh, Jesus prays with um, at Gethsemane, and the very symbolic experience of being with Elijah and Moses, the Old Testament uh, prophets and the law combined together. And they talk with Jesus. But the disciples are asleep. Now, I suppose there's two failures, really, aren't there? One is the fact that while all this praying and dazzling of white clothes was going on, the disciples were actually just fast asleep, which is one thing. But then, of course, we've got, as is explicitly made clear in all the Gospels, Peter didn't really know what he was saying, that he would make these shelters. We've got the new creation 
in Jesus, the new Israel in the 12 disciples, and yet Peter's first thought was to make a semi-permanent structure to house these three heavenly beings, to make on earth something out of earth's resources, a permanent enclosure for God. And that was not what Jesus was about. And they should have known that, having gone out to all these people and cured them of their diseases, that the, the good news was not for a building, that it was not for capturing, it was not for bottling up and storing, it was for sharing and being and living and doing. And so he comes down the mountain on the second, on that uh, following day to be confronted with not only just the three disciples who'd missed the point on the mountain, but the other nine who were on the plain with all the people waiting for Jesus to do what Jesus does. And they were unable to help this man. The story of the father and the son is quite protracted. We hear a long plea from the man, the father, uh, a lot of detail about the extraordinary and horrendous nature of his son's illness, really spelled out, ending in that creed occur, I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. And Jesus says to the disciples, not to the people, how unbelieving and wrong you people are. How long must I stay with you? How long do I have to put up with you? And the man, the, the son, is healed with merely a, merely a mention in the Gospels. So the key point here is about the disciples and the fact that they missed the point, that they didn't grasp what was in front of them. And that is so poignantly, so desperately, and so honestly true for us. Because in all of our lives, we live in the light of God's great love. We who call ourselves Christians have had an experience of God in our heart. We know the risen Jesus. We know the warmth, the assurance, the peace and the joy that comes from knowing that we are loved by the God who made all things. We know these things. Just like the disciples could go out and heal people. They knew God's power was with them. But did it change the way they think? Does it change the way we think? Does it make all our attitudes to our fellow brothers and sisters in the world one of equality and of non-judgmental extravagant love? Does it make us turn to the world with joy in our hearts, whatever difficulties we face? Does it make us put God at the centre of who we are and the first and foremost of our priorities and our objectives? Does it rule our lives? Well, the answer to all these questions, of course, is only very occasionally. How unbelieving and wrong you people are. All we can ever do is to submit ourselves to God and to rely upon God's strength. All of our human nature is trying to steer away from that and be the independent people we sometimes fool ourselves that we are, in control of our own destiny and our own lives, masters of everything we survey and in control of even our own health, wealth and happiness. Whereas ultimately, of course, we are creations of God and God owns us and God loves us. And it is that belief, it is that ability to see the truth of our lives that our whole experience comes to bear and our whole life's journey. God calls us home. And nothing else will ever really satisfy. Nothing else will really ever do, because that's where we're meant to be. And yet we are, as Jesus says, so unbelieving and so wrong so much of the time. It's a huge, huge challenge just to remember that and to try 
as much as we can in word and more importantly in action to show that we know God's love through the way we treat other people and the message of hope and reconciliation and joy that we bring to others.